All right, and now we're going to move on to our first keynote um, talk of the conference by Dr. Laura Castro Rojo. Uh, Dr. Ro Dr. Rojo is an art historian who holds a PhD in mythology, literature, and arts of the Persian Nate from the University of St. Andrew, Scotland. Uh, Dr. Rojo specializes in mythology, literature, and arts of the Persian Nate. Currently, she is working as a narrative designer and game developer. In addition to our academic and professional pursuits, Dr. Rojo directs a divulgación project called Las Plumas de Samud, where she shares insight about the history, art, and mythology of Iran and Mesopotamia. She is also a member of the research group Pistona y Video Juegos 2.0. Unfortunately, Dr. Rojo was unable to join us in person today due to unforeseen circumstances. However, she was committed to ensuring that we didn't miss out on her insight and has pre-recorded her talk for us, which we will be playing for you this morning. And the title of Dr. Rojo's presentation is Under the Shadow of the Huma, Representations of the Achaemenid Culture in Modern Media. How are you doing? I'm Dr. Laura Casarroyo, also known as Plumas in this world of Internet of Things. It's a huge pleasure to be here collaborating with Sasa and being one of the speakers at this event that I found so fun and so interesting at the same time. I would love to begin by thanking the organization for them contacting me and offering me to be one of the speakers because they showed a big interest in my job, which I'm greatly appreciative for. And it also allows me to do two things that I really love. One of them is talk. I love to talk. And the second one is talk about things that I'm passionate about, history, art, and video games. And also, I am very excited to be joined by so many amazing colleagues, professionals, and friends. So thank you very much to the rest of the participants, to all of you who are listening to me, and the rest of the speakers who will be in this conference. Gondor asked for help. Rohan absolutely responded. So we will do a small introduction about what we're going to look at the next minutes. I'm not going to commit to a number of minutes because every time I say we're going to talk about for about 45 or 50 minutes, I always go over. So we're going to talk about uh, this topic lets Ahura Matsada and their Deathsadas decide how long, but this is going to be very interesting because it talks about us as a society, as consumers of video games, as consumers of history and history of art, as a public with a product. As first representation that I have here surrounding me, we're going to be speaking about how the ecumenic culture was portrayed in modern media. Not only are we going to speak about video games, why only stop at video games when there are so many things? We're going to be discussing comics, films, video games, of course. And we are going to discuss not only ecumenics as such, but also the ecumenic dynasty. This discourse won't be so much focused to historical precision or accuracy with which its products were developed. What, why stick to a truthful or real discourse? We're going to be speaking about what does a product need to have to be considered ecumenic, the modern aesthetic to refer to an ecumenic culture, and how many intrinsical messages are there, good or bad or portrayed with this awful thing called Orientalism. When I do my lives, many times people who are watching me count how many times I mentioned Orientalism. And every time I say the word, I have to drink a sip of my tea. Since I've already said it many times, let me take a few sips. If you want to do that alongside me back at home, please do so. We are also going to be focusing on the most known iron con cities. Any excuse is a good excuse to talk about the Achaemenids. And in general, we will begin by mentioning that the ancient world is wildly popular, not only the Achaemenids, but the ancient world is quite popular. It's a historical walk into chapters. The first chapter, who are the Achaemenids? 
Who are the Ecumenics? Because m perhaps many of you don't know them. Ecumenics were a dynasty that ruled what we know as Bozorg, the big Iran community or region, the plains of Iran. And we're going to say that this is in the sixth century of the common era. We're not here to dwell into controversy, but this is known as a founder of the Ecumenic dynasty, Cairo II the Great. It's quite discussed whether this is very much Achaemenid or very little Achaemenid, but we have no doubt with Darayapush first Darío first, who is the founder of the dynasty. This family, this dynasty, was established in the region of current Iran, and they were expanding, reducing. This was a mobile or dynamic empire until something happens in the fourth century before the Common Era. And this is someone that I'm not really fond of, but I'm always mentioning, Alexander the Great, Eskandar, as he is known in Persian, up to the year 330. 30 AC, we have the Achaemenids ruling until Alexander the Great arrives there, and he's now willing or wanting to be the king of kings and ends with the Achaemenic dynasty. In spite of being one of the most influential dynasties in the ancient world, it is true that compared to others, it is not as well known. There's still a lot to study and still a lot to learn of the archaeological excavations, the historical and artistic remains that we still preserve, and perhaps some of the people that you know from this dynasty is Kuroshevo Dorg, Cyril I, the Great, that I wish first, Stadio for the first, Hershey's, very well known, Hershey's the first, Artaxerxes, names like this one, Cambyses, Bardius, and you're already set into this very good historical drama. I, you could, it could ring a bell, certain names could ring a bell for you, but as you say, this is not a masterclass about the Ecumenids, this is not about this, however, I thought it would be very interesting to bring a brief introduction in case any of you don't really know about this. If this is the first time in history that you're listening about this, it's okay. You know how many people have existed throughout this millennia that we don't know that they have existed? It's okay. We're all here to learn. There's nothing to worry about or to be embarrassed about. One of the most influential dynasties in the ancient world that you were like, I don't know about them. It's okay. They're very interesting. You know what? I'm going to be scooping this way. And let me just remain here in the corner throughout our conference so that you can see my slides better because I'm a North historian, so I have pictures. How many? Yes, many, many of them and many pictures. My slides have very little text because I love you watching the images and seeing them. So let's focus on what's the absolute earliest source, master in the universe, so to speak, of the Achaemenic aesthetic. Where do we understand the Achaemenic aesthetic? Where did we take it from? Where could we start extracting and building a visual language that, which later recreating modern products could convey Achaemenic culture it, that we could say that that is without a doubt Persepolis. Persepolis is known in Persian as Tacht e Hamshid or the Hamshid throne. You're going to notice that Achaemenics were very practical. So these alongside China were the inventors of bureaucracy. And thus in time, they quite didn't like it. So why do I mention this? Because the dynasty of the Parsa is also called the Parsan province in this city was called Parsa at its time. We could look at this as a lack of originality or on a practical sense. I think that's more what happened in a practical sense. Leave it up to you. So what was exactly Persepolis? Persepolis was, well, is not, is not, is, it was, was the ceremonial capital of the Achaemenic Empire and Dynasty. It's located in the modern province of Fars in the southeastern region of Iran. I took this picture because it's lovely, I love it. And let's set a map. This is a few 
pictures of Iran currently and a big map with a lovely arrow pointing where Persepolis is so that you can locate the region a bit. It was founded around halfway through the 6th century before the Kalmyun era, approximately 530-550 AC. Dates are not very exact, but Persepolis was not only a capital, you see, in the sense of a city or a palace. Why didn't I realize that I was covering the map? I didn't realize that. I'm sorry, I'm doing too many things over here. So Persepolis was not only a capital city, or it's not was just one city or one palace. It was a whole set of palace territory. It was huge territory compared to others. It was small, but it was completely independent. We have palaces, treasury departments, throne uh, rooms, party rooms, kitchens, administration, management, offices. You found everything here in the city. And it was so important because capitals in the Achaemenid Empire, there were plenty. Pasargada over here, a bit up there, we can see Ekbatan as well, and Shusha a bit near, you can see it right there, next to the V, the eighth, which were the provinces of the Achaemenid Empire, but the capital was Persepolis. However, the Achaemenid Empire had plenty of capitals, they were switching. However, Persepolis was always the ceremonial and spiritual capital. We might say the one that contained the imperial message, the best, better than any other city, emperor of the city, Tarareus the first, there he is. First, who had a very clear message, together we are stronger. And actually, it was that unity through the diversity, which is represented all throughout the, their art. You can see a few images here. I'm going to disappear for a bit. I'm already invisible so that you can see the pictures. The most important thing for Persepolis is that the place we could extract the most content visual content is there. We can use this visual content to recreate something that we might consider ecumenic. What do I mean by this? Persepolis was going to be the reference in capital letters of all of the products that we will see. Is that the only one? No, we all we have other archaeological sites that I've mentioned. The problem is that they're not as preserved or as well preserved and have been shattered as, for example, the palace complexes of Susa, Kvatana city, and also think about objects that are found in museums. But we might say that Persepolis is the main focus of a visual reference that creators would look for, the ones that they were trying to develop something remem reminding us of an acumenic reminiscence. If you are interested in this, you can ask, but how truth is this? How true is this in the recreations? Do we have something similar? Where, fortunately for all of us, now we do have that. The Getty Museum has organized, or a while, organized not long ago, two years ago, a virtual reconstruction of Persepolis called Persepolis Reimagined. And it is fabulous because it has a lot of material so that you, and this is totally free by the way, you can enter into Persepolis Reimagined via your websites and you can enter this amazing exhibit and you can see all of the recreation, which is very good quality. There's an amazing job behind all of this, which I think for the dissemination of the culture, this is wonderful because we can compare how what we have been sold as ecumenic is really similar or not to what happened reality. So this is a site that I visit constantly in my own lives because I believe it to be amazingly useful for many purposes. And you can see a comparison of the original pictures. This is the gate. Perhees built this original gate, one of my favorite characters. This is what happens when you study history of art. You end up having favorite kings, favorite deities, and of course, your worst enemies char characters. So here we have these bulls, which are the bulls 
from the front part of the gate of the nations and in the Getty reconstruction, you see how they would have looked like. And this is a polychrome design. Perhaps you've heard about this plenty because I'm sure that you know the ancient world very well, but we can repeat it if I haven't mentioned it. Ancient world is light in color. They love color, the shiniest, the brightest colors. And they also use a basic elemental color, primary color is the magenta, the yellow, the green, that's really bright. And I love putting both of these images next to each other so that you can compare it. The terrible state of preservation doesn't allow us to see how buildings really were. They, we have to imagine what they were like. And we might picture them as if they were completely shattered, stripped of any kind of color, of these very interesting bright colors. And actually we have other pictures here. We can see one of the stairs of the Apigan. And these are two images of Getty itself. Let me just disappear for a second and I'm invisible now, this is one of the images of Getty. And if you click in this little uh, rosette at the center, it can show you the bigger picture. And of course, this is joined by historical texts that could explain a bit about what you're looking at and why does it look this way. And Getty doesn't pay me to advertise this, but this is very well done. This is incredibly beneficiary that we have it. Those of us who dedicate or work with Iranian culture to see how it was truly the case. You can see this red column painted with red, but this was like a red. I mean, this is not just like a crimson layer or thin layer. This is a bright red that really pops to the eye. You can see balls painted in blue and all of the texture what had a polychrome surface all of them, which was really important. And actually, archaeological missions that are currently working at Persepolis, for example, the one called Sapienza di Roma, I think that it's from the Rome University, they're working on this, finding pigment in these statues, these means in the texture. So this means that there is archaeological evidence that this was painted in very bright colors and this is the organization to save to save keep ancient world list save keep an ancient world filled with color because this sand and beige like ancient world is not really favorable and plus if we're dealing with things like orientalism and you know other currents then we're in a pickle so let's begin with the first product of represent representations of academic aesthetic and let's do this with an Iranian comic Tachteh Yubidan Tachteh Yubidan means the eternal throne the immortal throne and this story is focused in this kind gentleman you can see in the cover of the comic that is no other than alexander the great that scandal and after conquering persepolis well let me give you maybe other kinds of facts because i'm getting excited i look at him and i'm Nervous. I cannot avoid it. But let me tell you, Tati Yubidan is a comic of the Iranian study, Yurak study, which was published in 2020, and tells the story of Eskandar, Alexander the Great, after the destruction of Persepolis, because the state was brought to dust or reduced to dust, and it was his obsession to find the source of eternal youth the source of eternal life. And this is with something very interesting because it makes two narrative lines. This obsession of Alexander the Great not to die. I am sorry, I don't control Iskandar's figure outside of the Iranian context, but in the literary context was like the RPG players, the main quest, the main quest is his mission. Iskandar has a lot of books written about him, and he spends his life searching for the source of eternal youth and how not to die the comic and it sounds a bit stupid this issue or this idea how not to die but that's what he does and actually comic is very interesting because it greatly supports its narrative in the oneric dimension the world of dreams the nightmares that Iskander has after having ravished persepolis and it does an exploration 
about how his tortured mind may be able to find a solution, supposedly the source of eternal youth. And what really catches our attention is this mixture narrative supports its basis in the world of dreams, in this obsession and blame of Alexander the Great for having destroyed Persepolis. And what really gets just our attention, for example, is the election of aesthetic. You can clearly see that there has been an observation and a direct copy of the real structure at Persepolis. Here, for example, you can see that right next to it, we have different ministers. I'm sorry, not ministers, ambassadors that are here, that are here presenting offerings to the King of Kings. I'm disappearing once again. Here you can see how they take all of the depictions and we can see a King of Kings in the throne in between two columns with this famous bulls not only from Persepolis, but the one we you have in the real photography, that is at the Louvre. That is not Persepolis. However, it's from Susa. But so that you can see something that's pretty well related to the ecumenic world, the bulls. If we go back for a bit, just a bit, not way back here, we can see how the comics cover is already providing so many details about the narrative line. And of course, none of this is innocent. All, all of these products want to send a message. Persepolis is completely destroyed. And the element of ruin is a very important. The role of ruin always surrounded a scandal is fundamental. That's the main focus of the narrative. Ruin, this ruinous state of the city can be due to two reasons that they're literally copying here you can see that with this door it happens it's like that even the parts that are missing in the upper right corner for example there's a small piece that's missing from there and in the cover of the comic you can see the exact same detail is the same fragment that's missing so this was alexander in a natural state and not natural observation and a very clear message which is alexander was savage alexander was well in the Iranian literary world, there are only two approaches to what Skander did. One of them, one of these approaches was that he was a hero, the same uh, size or level than other heroes, uh, which appear in the epic literature. For example, Feridun, the King of Kings in the Book of Kings, Garshob, he's an air hero as well of the Zoroastrianism tradition. They're, play they're people who place Alexander at the same level, relevant, other people who don't. There are people who think that Alexander could have just stayed home, just keeping a package of, of matches before releasing it in Persepolis. But the destruction of Persepolis was not only a destruction, it was a fire. This stone, this is a stone that burns really easily. And this kind of stone still have several marks of this fire and if you anytime have the chance to visit Persepolis you can see the limestone that really makes up the context and the territory. You can see these white lines that stretch all throughout the limestone there and this is quite evident uh, or it's a very strong archaeological evidence of what happened there. And as you can see, this comic references to Persepolis are based on archaeological studies and sites. And with this, what I mean is that by being Iranian artists, that they have more access to archaeological remains at Persepolis, because all of these pictures have taken it from the internet, and there's very good quality pictures from it. And 
I think archaeologists wanted to emphasize the archaeological ruins of Takht e Mashid, and it is possible to an easier visual connection with the audience. Horak studios know that the people who will be reading the comic are Iranian, and it is more simple to connect with images that they've already set in their cultural, imaginary, or unconscious, such as the bulls over there, or, for example, the representatives of different embassies bringing offerings to the king. As I said, this could be considered historicist content more than historical content because it is a fiction story showing us the dreams of Eskander. But I think that it was very interesting to go to the original source and copy it. And I'm saying copying it, not something negative. That's not negative. Copying an archaeological site that you want to portray as accurately as possible because it contributes to the narrative that you're using, presenting a completely devastated Persepolis under the hands of someone who has a doubtful reputation, so to speak, in the Iranian world. We won't be giving out notes. This is not a casting. This is not a contest. I do not wish to mention that something was good was bad, but it's true that there is a message. How can I explain this without listening to Strombotic? All of the narrative has a message behind it. There is no innocent narrative. What this comic wants to do is to condemn the figure of Eskandar. It's not good or bad. It wants to set a particular idea for the audience so that the audience looks at him from their perspective. What do I mention this? Because narrative is not innocent and all products respond to a message. We have talked about that. Yeah, we're done. And we are going to be talking about the products that I love talking about. Not necessarily because this is something good, but Cha, ladies, gentlemen, and other creatures of the night with you, as as in Creed Odyssey. I want to disclaim something. I'm not going to be discussing game mechanics, not talking about anything other than aesthetic and narrative. Because I'm a personal big, big fan of the Assassin's Creed saga, although I from the previous versions, I am the greater fan of the first version that's based in the Lamutz um, novel and the original I love. Uh, however, unfortunately, Assassin's Creed Odyssey has a very, very big problem. That is that Assassin's Creed Odyssey is very Orientalist. So much. Oh, so much. It has a representation of the ecumenic which aesthetically we could say there was research done, there was a lot of research. For example, we have the images of the capitals right there, which are really well revealed using different archaeological references, which are real. And we have none other than the immortals of the Palace of Susa. These are the immortals. Don't worry, we'll be discussing other immortals. Because, yeah, how can we not mention these other immortals? I was so excited to do this, rep this presentation. So we can see them portrayed or copied as they were. As you can see in the images up here, one of the buildings that show up in this game. And let's see, we're not going to be exactly discussing Assassin's Creed Odyssey. However, we're going to be discussing their DLC, their downloadable content, which is a bit, is more than questionable in their representation of the Achaemenid dynasty, at least the way that the Achaemenids are portrayed in the narrative. I'm going to show you another image I really love because I feel, I'm sorry, I'm in the middle. Disappear, blue mask. As you can see, these are two representations of the special Shurhi's guard. The one you can see touching his beard with a reflexive look is Shurhi the first, no list, and the two soldiers at his side that we did use, that we can assume are immortals. As you can see, are Lamasus and also a go Riton and quote unquote sphinxes of Persepolis, so that you can see that there's a lot of aesthetical elements that have been kept in purpose. The curve of the wings, not only in the sets that they are carrying on their heads, 
as you can see, Lamasu had the exact same cover on their heads, these decoration on their heads that you can see depicted or portrayed in the walls of Persepolis. And there's a detail that's quite interesting about copying such small details. For example, the way that the beard of the immortal that we can see, the one that's furthest back, is copying as such the small dots that you can see over there of the first layers of what would be the uh, hair of the beard and it has some feathers longer feathers up until the end of the beard so on a historical reconstruction level they did a great job and there are a lot of references it could be decoration for the head that Hermes could have used this could be clothes that Hermes could have worn on his day-to-day -day. however however there is a big problem and this is the issue of the narrative okay let's see I insist that they're not paying me to do Ubisoft is not paying me. But if you've ever played this DLC, that big effort that was clearly set portraying the universe of the Iranians of the Achaemenic dynasty, we've seen the clothes, we've seen the architecture, we've seen the decor, and many things you can see right behind me. You have evidence that there has been a big emphasis, a detailed research of archaeological originals to portray it in the game actually assassin's creed 3 but assassin's creed in general they pride themselves on having a set a, a group of phds in history historians archaeologists that help them develop their products that's great so far however what happens it might seem that now all the effort went to the artists because when we go to the narrative plane let's say that the achaemenic dynasty being very very well portrayed very very well portrayed uh, not so much. And this is one of the first products that I find a bit dangerous. Why? Because you're probably thinking on another one. Let's say 300. You can tell me, plumas, feathers, 300 is worse. 300 is not worse. 300 has a very clear intention. 300 never, ever wanted or had the intention of being historical. 300 is many things. Historical is not one of them. It's sad, but Zack Snyder himself. What happens is Assassin's Creed, one of his sales and marketing arguments or, um, or feature is the quality of historical accuracy. He care to the detail and attention while portraying historical processes. Of course, all of these within a framework of fiction, of it being a game, we have to make it fun, no doubt about it. It happens, however, that if you love Akamene, so like a command culture, don't play this representation because it is terrible and it really hurts me in a personal uh, plane. The worst part was Hergis. Why was that? Well, it might seem that the history of Iran was not as important. It might have seemed that way. The thing is, how can I say this without me just seeming very loony but uh, her he sees a very questionable character which i understand could have been very questionable in the eyes of the greeks he's sure he's of course he was however this happens after the medical wars and the Peloponnese, for example it is a very hot area once persians turn around and they say okay let's let them be hellenics for example spartans athenians Stavidis, all of that those towns started getting attacked because the important thing was not whom are you fighting against just having someone to fight against. And a historical fact, for example, very big spoiler, Hermes was murdered. Hermes was murdered by a person of the court called Artabanus. And Artabanus didn't have, might have seen, greater motive than assassin them. Because I think he said, I would be very much good looking or more good looking than you with my crown on because according to these beautiful images that you can see the narrative wasn't as faithful i insist 
the Greeks, for example, are not very well portrayed and they fell into one of the worst Orientalist cliches, cheers, which is the issue of the Asian villain, the Asian tyranny, you know, this uh, someone who's here to steal our freedom, our democracy, and everything that makes us free. Ma non troppo, not, not really. It is very interesting, really. I could spend hours talking about DLC because I find unbelievable, unbelievable in a good sense that they are keeping a narrative of it. This is an, the enemy. In very coherent, if you are playing from the perspective of the Yunani, the Greeks, you're playing from the perspective of the Hellenians. And the Iranians are their enemies, of course. However, they're very badly portrayed. And it is very interesting how to visually compensate an archaeological construction that was so well done. So much effort, so much creativity. Because, for example, for me, uniforms of immortals, they're not that way. Actually, I'm going to show you a picture. We never can have enough immortals. Here you can see them. But it is well done. They're very well portrayed with our masks. It has the idea. It gives out an idea of the Punisher and 300 and such. However, on a narrative level, they're not really reflecting the historical process that is, as it was. And there was an intention to this as well. Assassin's Creed mentions that it's historical, it's not really historical. However, Assassin's Creed is like Age of Empires and many other products. The first thing that we see when we buy product, for example, Age of Empires. And do you remember where, when Assassin's Creed Valhalla was mentioned, and a lot of people, and they didn't have to know this, but the first thing that a lot of people said, Vikings with no horns, where are we getting to? A lot of people in history, in our history, we said it was about time, okay? These are things that just trickle down the collective imaginary and they set, they stay there as if they were real. That is why it's so important that we take care of the way that we portray other cultures, which have had a lot of different approaches, a lot of different stories to them, to separate, for example, West and East. The Thermopolis battle, was that something important to say West? What we say in West and East is that it didn't exist because it really hurts us to have that division. And as what, once the Achaemenids went back home, the Hellenics started fighting each other brutally. And it wasn't about defending West. It, West didn't exist. However, this game mentions that that was the case. There was a threat. The others, the Achaemenids, and the game keeps this narrative, this discourse, because it says that there's at least one person in the world that still believes that this happened this way. If we don't know where this comes from, it could be dangerous. This is an Orientalist approach, the end of the 19th century, not the end. Unfortunately, the beginning, the middle, the end of the 19th century is this Orientalistic approach that believes that us from the West are better than the East. The everyday life was very much complex. Hellenians, Hellenics and Iranians, for example, mixed a lot and people liked being alive they actually dedicated more time into being alive than killing each other so these kinds of discourses or speeches that showcase them as a big atrocious terrible cruel and particularly authoritarian and totalitarian enemy really hurts the culture because we understand dynasties or historical processes in a wrong way and of course, we cannot misunderstand a historical process without bringing the jewel of the crown, the biggest joke told about the academic aesthetic, but still interesting to analyze, which is the 300 saga. I'm going to leave the comic aside, although we'll mention it, but let's talk about film because I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to tell you, the, to, to be the one to tell you that there is a sequel. We're talking about 300 and 300, the origin of the empire or rise of an empire.
you're not really taking this joke or getting this joke. But let's, let's take it with a grain of salt. Why? I was the first one to go watch 300 in the movies, on the theater. But what? But I also thought, what was this deployment of violence and special effects and blood everywhere? I liked it. But what happened? Never did 300 had the purpose of being a historical film. It was about just blowing our brains out and getting to a movie theater and saying, wow, and we all laughed and that's it. I really love 300 and won't stop being a PhD, of course, due to that. However, it's incredible what two movies can bring because the first one, or the second one, we watched it on Twitch a while ago, about four years ago. And there's nowhere, you know, there's nowhere we can really say that. However, it is very interesting to look at the aesthetic that they chose for the Akimane. The one I love the most is Shorties, okay? Probably the people who are already used to listening to me are already completely bored of listening to me say the same thing. You have to be really handsome, handsome like Rodriguez Santoro, the actor who portrays Shorties, so that they can put on that look and you still look dignified. There are various pictures here. One of them is a clip of Rodrigo Santoro in his film, in his casual outfit on the Met Gala to party with their friends. Now we have one uh, worse, the one of the comics, the original Shorties comic, and right next to it, up uh, over everything, a representation of real churches with his beard and his curly hair. It's very likely that it was very like mine. There were wigs as well, and the representation of churches in an honest out creed. And I put the cut there because why not? Let's set something clear, okay? Churches never thought he was a god. Achaemenids never believed that there were deities. And actually, let me tell you a detail. Churches, it might seem, due to the historical evidence that we have, he was one of the first, three first Achaemenids, if we count Zero, Dara, and Churches. He was one of the most pious ones because he has many more religious inscriptions dedicated to Hura Mazda, the Yasara, the Soro Aestrian pantheon, which was the official religion of Achaemenids. So this means Churches was pretty devout for the standards of the time. And he didn't believe he was a god. However, 300 is perfect because it exactly reproduces this very negative and oriental stereotype cheers that we still drag from thinking that this is a big villain big Asian villain coming to destroy the values of a democratic and free West that is what the party wanted to the, the film wanted to convey and it did it very well because this didn't have the intention of being a historical product they wanted to convey a message we are the West, right? And this was written and produced and filmed under the context of the Iraq war, where there was still a need to reinforce the feeling of us from the West. 300 Spartans really taking in this wave of Asian, Asian tyranny that is coming over us. And we is we start to set uh, not only Asian features, but also Muslim features, because they have nothing to do with Islam. This happened in the 5th century before the common era, right? So almost 400, almost 1,000 years before Muhammad had his revelation and Islam became a religion, okay? We're talking about almost a millennia of difference. However, these association of Orientalism with Muslim element in an oppressive way, contrary to the Western values. That exactly what 300 is fighting for. And it is undefendable, of course. It's no joke. But that's their intention. That's what they want to convey. So I said a lot of fun things. One aesthetic, as you can see, the Ackerman aesthetic is still pretty much reinforced on lions and bulls and then the immortals, of course, because we have to put immortals there. This mixture between uh, Sub Zero Scorpio from Mortal Kombat or Ninja Gaiden for those of you who are a bit older like me. So you can understand what this is going to there's no intention 
but you you can see some of the details. For example, here we can see the representation of the lion of the ribbon. Or this is from the first film, and I have to show you the first film actually made me very happy, brought me a lot of joy. I enjoyed it a lot. I still enjoy it when I watch it, but the second one, the second film, there is no way of picking it uh, up because it doesn't even make sense because it talks about the Battle of Marathon and Plataea and it talks about the Mass of Faith. You know, this is unbelievable. And I said, some references that is where Shershis is so that's allegedly Persepolis you see that it has very little to do with the Persepolis I showed you but you can see that there are a few details the sphinxes and what's behind Shershis I thought there were bulls but I don't see it to be a, a perhaps a bull with um filed horns or a, a dog you can see the red columns there i don't know whether you can see them right underneath perhaps i can point it out right here 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 that's where the red persepolis columns are which really caught my attention so look at that what are they i have no idea that over there that Broken Capital, I don't know what that is, but 300, I believe, is quite an enjoyable product. However, with a pinch of salt, look at it, understand it, this is not historical reality, and there was not su such thing as this Asian giant, because audience, let's always remember that Persians, every time Persians turn around, Iranians are always right behind them. It wasn't a purpose of uniting with the enemies just as long as they pay us just for a small period of time and that's it and to close i have here some conclusions and let me disappear again i want you to look at the size of the capitals of the bulls as you can see here we can see the bulls passing by the huge uh size these holes that you can see there they could have had another piece potentially made of stone or other potentials such as ivory or metal, something shiny, because Achaemenes wanted to have bright and shiny things. And conclusions that we could learn. There is indeed an Achaemenic aesthetic that is based on the archaeological reference of Persepolis, and it greatly influences specific visual archetypes, for example, bulls, lions, and buildings with columns, and archaeological remains such as the capitals of the bulls here. Or capitals of other beasts as birds, bisons, for example, and once again, lions. Second, this aesthetic is not always linked to an historical research to find out what's behind all of these details. It's only portrayed as if it were, well, that's what they had, right? And it is interesting because you start researching, for example, the archaeology because you want to portray academic culture in your comic, your video game, your, your product. You could read a bit about the academics and stereotypes. It, it, look for yourself whether stereotypes exist or are just mere stories. So we are improving the way we portray Ecumenics. Exhibitions such as the Gettys Museum, for example, help us to expand a vision of this historical discourse without dragging these horrible preconceptions of Orientalism. And speaking about that, cheers. That it might seem that we have eradicated that, however, we still have that set well in our culture. 300, for example, is very clear about that, saying we are the best. We, okay, beware, beware with the people who use we to talk about historical past. If you weren't alive, there is no we that is valid. I wasn't in the Battle of Thermopolis, and I assume that none of you were. So if you were, please send me an email because I have a lot of questions. However, we have to be very aware of the products we are consuming and open our minds to other historical realities that haven't had a lot of representation right now and are subject to a lot of negative stereotypes, which 
promote the world being an unfair side. This is separation, for example, the West and the East is not true. So I invite you to read a wonderful book called Orientalism from Edward Said. You can look at it or find it on any library or any site, Amazon, Casa del Libro, your local library, wherever you want to look for books. And I would like to end this presentation by thanking once again, Sasa, for having me here in this event. I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. Let me go up a bit. Did you see the magic of the OS? Thank you so much for the organizers, to the organizers for inviting me. I spent a great time here. I hope that you enjoyed it as well. My name, as I mentioned, is Plumas, and I have a project of bilingual information dissemination, Spanish and English. You have my contact. You can find me on Twitch mainly, but also on Discord, on Patreon if you want to help me out. And you have my contact information right there on the screen. Salsa, thank you so much. I would have loved to be here, love to answer to your questions and talk to you a bit, but if something, if we've learned something of one of the most influential movies of the 90s Jurassic Park is that life finds a way. And as life opened itself before me, I wasn't able to be there under the circumstances which I cannot change. However, it was a great event. It was a great pleasure for me to be here with you. I hope that I see you soon. Big hugs, and as you say, as we say in Persia, hodases. <laughs>